We're continuing with the series, The Twelve, and we're looking at Jesus' disciples. But let me begin by asking you this. Do you have someone in your family who is always going after attention? Or maybe a friend who is fantastic and brilliant. Somehow next to them, you're always made to feel second. I'm sure you've heard or you know stories. Well, one I know is a girl who has an overachieving brother. And since a young age at school, they would often forget her name and she was always recognized as her brother's sister. Though she's incredibly talented in her own right, but she always felt inadequate compared to the brother. So over time, she just felt inferior and she didn't appreciate her own talents and it affected everything she did. And she often felt she could never achieve anything. She blamed herself for not doing it as well as her brother, she felt, you know, she wasn't smart enough, not likable enough, and she just felt insignificant and she wanted to hide. She almost gave up what she did well. And it is hard living up to the expectation to be her brother's sister. You know, you could be living, or it is difficult living under someone's shadow and to feel second, whether it is in the family, at work, among friends, or even in church. There is that one that is doing better, more successful than you. You know, when I started looking at the character of Andrew, this is what it might seem like to him. Who is Andrew? And I think your immediate response would be Peter's brother. And I think almost every time Andrew is mentioned in the gospel, he's Peter's brother. The inference is there because people might not know who Andrew was, but everyone knew Peter. And Peter seemed like the born leader. He was among the inner circle. Peter had an extraordinary and life-changing conversations with the Lord. He was the one that walked on water. He was the one that was asking questions. Peter was at the forefront and always in the spotlight. But what about Andrew? How often was he mentioned in the Bible? In fact, you may not even have noticed him if he wasn't mentioned as Peter's brother. Well, Andrew was born in Bethsaida, the principal fishing port of Palestine. His parents were jo jo Jonah and Joanna, and his brother was Simon Peter. And they came from a fishing business because they are mentioned alongside with their business partner and friend, Zebedee, and his sons, James and John, and they were all fishermen. Now, Andrew's name is actually Greek. It's not a Hebrew name. It means manly, the strong one. And some considered him to be perhaps the younger brother because he was always mentioned second. But maybe he was mentioned second because he was just less prominent. So today, let us look at some of the events in which he was mentioned in the Bible. Now, let's look at John chapter 1, verse 35 to 42. The next day, again, John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus and he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Now, John the Baptist was talking and two of his disciples, they were Andrew and the other one likely to be John. 38, Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Now, there are three things we can learn from Andrew. We see Andrew here was John the Baptist's disciple. He was a follower of John who has been teaching and paving the way for the Messiah to come. And John the Baptist was a great and humble man of God. Even Jesus said this of him, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has risen no one greater than John the Baptist. So Andrew's mentor was someone influential, he had a great and important message and somewhat popular as many came to the Jordan to see him. But no matter how great, how influential or how popular John the Baptist was, he was still just a man. You know, John the Baptist knew that he, and he made sure his disciples knew as well, that his place was just to call attention to Jesus. In John 3, 28, 29, he says, I am not the Christ, John the Baptist said this, but I have been sent before him. 
So as soon as Jesus' ministry began, people were following Jesus and John the Baptist was losing disciples, but that didn't matter to him for he knew his place. He said, Jesus, he must increase, but I, John the Baptist, must decrease. So when, John, when Jesus appeared, Andrew was quickly able to discern and respond and follow Jesus. You know, Andrew seemed like a person hungering for the word of God and for God's work, because I can imagine Jesus had always been first place in Andrew's life. So when Andrew heard Jesus speak, he was ready to commit and follow. He said, he said to Jesus, where are you staying? And that was John the Baptist's desire. He pointed his followers to Jesus. So Andrew was able to recognize Jesus as the fulfillment of the long prophesied Messiah because he said, we have found the Messiah. You know, today we must remember men are just men. Don't expect these men of God to be gods. Follow Jesus. We are to imitate the faith of godly leaders. That is a biblical command. But we, you know, we obey and we submit to them because they are faithful and godly. We are to respect them. We are to learn from them. But they are not our object of worship. You know, Andrew didn't hesitate. He just went and followed Jesus. He knew whom to follow. And he positioned himself where he could receive and grow. He asked, where are you staying? You know, one of the obstacles of man coming to Christ is because we are man-centered. We focus either on man's greatness or their shortcomings. And then it can become an obstacle to follow Christ. Human beings are imperfect. They can disappoint, they can fall short, and they can fail. I remember one of the major obstacles for me to come to God, to come to church, was my wrong focus. I remember many years ago, very clearly, I had this conversation with a friend who wanted to invite me to church. And he asked me if I believed in God. And I said, yeah, I think there's a higher being or power. And then he said, why don't you come to church with me? I immediately said no. And I told him because of all the bad encounters and poor experiences I had in the past with religion. And I said, there's a lot of hypocrisy with people. People are fake. They are full of pride. And I was thinking I was better than them. And then my friend said this, he said, why don't you try to go to church and seek God? It is he who you should be seeking and worshiping. Man is not the object of your worship and attention. You want to follow God, not man. And somehow when he said that, it clicked. And all this time I've been focusing on men. And you know, that became a Jesus invitation moment. It was like, come and you will see. And it was a breakthrough in my journey of faith. I did. I gave it a go. I came to church for the first time since I was a teenager. When I was a teenager, I was forced to go, but this time was different. I came with an intent of seeking God. And you know, when you seek, you will find. When you knock and the door will be open and for everyone who asks, receives. And God just let me right back where I belong into his house. You know, were the disappointments along the way, were there times when I was aggravated and people irritated me? Of course. But that is when I remind myself all the time, no one is perfect. I'm not perfect. And that keeps me grounded. It reminds me to be humble, telling myself the reason I go to church is to worship God. I fellowship with people, but I put my trust in God. And now this doesn't mean we don't respect our earthly leaders, we must ne but we must never make them equal to our Savior or Jesus. Don't put that burden on man. He can never carry it. And that is what was happening in the Corinthian, Corinthian church. In 1 Corinthians first 12, you will see Paul said, some follow Apollos, some follow Paul, and some follow Peter. And that was what was happening in the Corinthian church. They had the tendency to emphasize the messenger instead of the message. They were prone to glory in men, and they got their eyes off the Lord and onto the messenger. We are disciples of Christ, not Apollos, Peter, or Paul. Andrew was taught by John the Baptist, the one who knew he wasn't the Messiah. And he says it with joy and faith, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. So even though, you know, he's a great teacher, man of God, but Andrew understood he was not man-centered and also he was not self-focused. Remember, Andrew was the first called, but when it came to the naming of the 12 disciples in all four gospels, Peter was named first. For instance, in Matthew 10, 2, it says, the names of the 12 disciples, apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. So whenever Andrew is mentioned, he is named 
after his brother as though he needed that reference. He was living in the shadow of his brother and even serving under his shadow. Unlike Peter, who was brash and dominant, and unlike John and James, they were known as sons of thunder, so you can imagine what they're like. Andrew wasn't someone you would notice. He actually barely made it in the inner circle. It seemed like prominence was given to other people. He was the first to be called, yet these other apostles are getting the spotlight. We do not know if he struggled with that thought of being pushed to the sidelines, taking a back seat, or did he think it was unfair? He was probably among the 12 when they argued who's the greatest. But nevertheless, it reminds us all today in whatever we do, it isn't about our prominence at all. It's about Jesus' prominence. Is he increasing in your life? Are you okay not to be appreciated, applauded, or recognized? Are you okay with other people getting the credit? You know, sometimes we can be so preoccupied with whether we are liked or not. You know, I had someone complain because I didn't give them a like on Facebook. Do we compete for attention, recognition, and praise? You know, the great physician, conductor, composer, pianist, music educator, Leonard Bernstein, was once asked which instrument was the most difficult to play. He thought for a minute and then he replied, the second fiddle. I can get plenty of first violinists, a head violinist, but to find someone who can play the second fiddle with enthusiasm, that's a problem. And if we have no second fiddle, we have no harmony. You know, Andrew was playing the second fiddle, not the lead, but the helper. And by what we know from the Gospels, Andrew didn't seem to mind. Otherwise, there would have been incidents highlighting his shortcomings as did with the other disciples. Andrew didn't need to be center of attention. He was willing to take a back seat to support others as long as the work was being done. And there didn't seem to be any begrudging or resentment. In Matthew 25, 15, Jesus said the parable of the talents. He said, to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. You know, when God gives one disciple five talents, another two talents, and another one talent, he has his reasons. And very likely they are different from what we think because his ways and thoughts are higher than ours. We can trust him. We all have different talents, abilities, gifts, experiences. He made you to be you. So let us learn today to be content with what you have and be faithful with what you have been given. It's easy to look at those that are doing better or more successful and think God is unfair to me. What about me? You know, avoid that trap of comparison because Paul says it's foolish. In 2 Corinthians 10, 12, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. They are foolish. You know, Jesus encouraged humility when he taught, when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret, that your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. In other words, don't be impressed with yourself, boast about what you do or look for paybacks for your kindness. Don't do anything that says, look at me. You know, self-focus is a sign of pride. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand, trusting that it is God who exalts and He is our rewarder. He will at the proper time reward you, 1 Peter 5, 6. You know, self-focus is not only wanting the spotlight, when it's the other extreme, for instance, when we become so self-focused about our efforts and our ability that we're afraid to be noticed or we're afraid of failure, comparison, that we step back when we should be stepping forward. We become too afraid. And then we are like the wicked and the lazy servant in the parable of the talents because he was afraid he hid the talent. Now that too is a focus on self. Remember, it's not about you. We are created not to shine for our own glory or get applause from men, but every gift that we have is meant to shine through our lives for God's glory. You know, a lot of the times in ministry, you know, it's not about I. Church is not about I. We should not compare, you know, one another or with ministries. We are together and God should get all the glory. 
I remember one sister, she was having doubts about sharing her testimony and she was thinking she wasn't good enough, she wasn't worthy. And I said, it's not about you. Just tell your story. It's not, a, you know, it's not about whether we are worthy. He's worthy. If we are to boast, to boast about the cross. Testimonies are not about us. It's about him. We testify his goodness. So let us just be faithful and bloom where God has positioned us. Know your lane and run in it. You know, the most important thing is that you are where God wants you to be and doing what he wants you to do so that he may be glorified. Because if someone runs in someone, if you are running in someone else's lane, you will never get to where you ought to be. You'll be walking in the wilderness. You'll be taking the long road and the wrong road. You know, I think if Andrew kept doubting and questioning God, what about me? He wouldn't be able to run in his own lane. He'd be looking over the shoulder of others. And if he was comparing and competing with other people, around him, he would never be able to focus on his call and his mission. Remember, God called Andrew, Peter, John and James to be fishers of men. Andrew did not depart from that call because every time Andrew is mentioned, he is bringing someone to Jesus. He wasn't man-centered. He wasn't self-centered. He was kingdom-focused. You know, Andrew may not have been a preacher of thousands. You know, he didn't bring thousands to the Lord, but he was certainly a personal soul winner. And I think John the Baptist was a pioneer for that. And Andrew, as a student, I think he caught some of that. In fact, Andrew was the one that brought his brother Peter to Jesus. That was his first action and reaction. He went and told his brother. He brought his brother to Jesus. And, you know, he knows the character of his brother. He pretty much would have known Peter would take over because if anyone knew Peter besides Jesus, it would be Andrew. But he brought Peter to Jesus. You know, today we ought to have the same kind of passion. I remember when I first encountered Jesus, I was just telling everyone I knew. Of course, not everyone responded, but the excitement and the joy. But, you know, as years go by, we tend to think a little too much. Our human nature sets in and we overthink. We become fearful of people's reaction and rejection. You know, I pray that we have the same impulse and passion to win people over for Jesus. I pray that passion, you know, we revive that passion for the lost, the joy of salvation to be revived today. Bring people to Jesus. Because if you notice all the other times that, you know, Andrew appears in the gospel, he was bringing someone. You know, in the multiplication of the fish and the loaves in Galilee, you know, the feeding of the 5,000. You know, when Jesus asked the disciples to feed the crowd, it was an impossible task. Even though they have already witnessed Jesus doing many miracles, but still the disciples didn't get it. So when Jesus gave them that task to feed them, most of the disciples just saw the overwhelming problem. Let us look at the book of John 6, 5 to 9. Lifting up his eyes, Jesus... Seeing that a large crowd was coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? Verse 6, Jesus said this to test him, Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get a little. And then verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? It says here, Jesus said this to test Philip, for he himself knew what he would do. You know, Philip seemed to have failed the test. He only saw the problem. It's not enough, Jesus. But then Andrew, he recognizes the insufficiency. He knew what the boy had wasn't enough, but he brought him to Jesus anyway. Andrew seemed to have done the right thing. He seemed, it seemed like he passed the test because for we know what happened after that because Jesus acted and he multiplied and, you know, it became more than enough. God was able to multiply. Imagine what would happen if Andrew simply just dismissed the boy and sent him back into the crowd. What if Andrew thought to himself that, you know, such little food, simply too insignificant, is not worth presenting it to the Messiah? Andrew knew it was impossible, but he presented it to Jesus anyway. Lord, this is all I have. You do something about it. And it was a miracle waiting to happen. Even if it's little, let us have faith to do that. Be the one that brings little things to God and let God multiply. Let God magnify. 
Even when the situation seems impossible, bring someone to Jesus. Sometimes, you know, we dismiss the little things in life and we miss that opportunity for a miracle. I pray God will open our eyes to see what others have missed. Have an eye to recognize value. Andrew may not have been quite sure how the problem was going to be resolved, but he knew who to bring it to. You know, we often think what we do is very, of very little value. We might even think our gifts are very limited, but be faithful and surrender it and bring it to Jesus. Andrew gave that boy an opportunity to encounter a miracle working God and to feel significant and to be a huge blessing. I can imagine him going back to his parents, telling everyone what he did. And then again, in John 12, 20 to 23, Andrew is again bringing someone to Jesus. John 12, verse 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now, we know one of the themes of the book of John is not only Jesus is the Savior of the Jews, but of all nations. There is a universal emphasis. So we have Greeks here who wanted to meet Jesus because Jesus had been saying, you know, he came for the lost sheep of Israel. So Philip, maybe, probably he didn't know what to do. He couldn't decide what to do. And he went and asked Andrew for advice. That's what it seems like here, right, in the, in the scripture. And Andrew's solution was when he faced with a problem, let's bring him to Jesus. We don't know what happened after that, but we know it was the right thing to do. Andrew may not have led a Great, had a great part in everything, but he had a great heart. And that's what fisher of men do, bringing people to Jesus. He was faithful in his mission. He had a heart for people to encounter Jesus. And from what we know from church historical accounts and tradition, Andrew kept bringing people to Christ, even after Jesus' death. He never seemed to care about putting his own you know, life at risk. Tradition has it that he converted the wife of a provincial uh, Roman governor to Christianity. And the governor was infuriated and he, he demanded that his wife renounce her faith. She refused and the governor had Andrew crucified. And he was crucified probably close to 70 AD in the city of Petras, which was the uh, northern coast of Greece. But even during, his, even during his agonies, as he hung on an X-shaped cross, he was like his brother Peter. He considered himself unworthy of being crucified the same way Jesus was. Andrew was crucified on an X-shaped cross. And Andrew continued to spread the gospel. He was telling passers-by to turn to Christ for salvation. And like many of the other apostles, he went well beyond Judea to bring the gospel into all the world as Christ had commanded him to do. And you know, church historian Eusebius wrote that he may have even brought the gospel as far, you know, as Ukraine and Scotland. Andrew met and encountered the Messiah and his life was not the same again. His first reaction was to go and tell someone about it. He is the one to announce and deliver the good news to the people around him. Today, we need Andrew's passion we need Andrews today, you know, one who is excited about Jesus, one who acknowledges Jesus as the Messiah, one who sees potential even in the small things. Andrews who would look past being noticed, recognized, praised, or even appreciated, who doesn't care if he's not in the spotlight. You know, the one who's playing the second fiddle, but always be the one helping, supporting, laboring quietly and faithfully, just doing the work of Christ to win souls for the kingdom. And what God has called him to do, he did it. He was obedient to his call. Many of us have a supporting role. Many of us may be just helpers, but it doesn't mean you're not important. Even though you may not have a visible part, but it doesn't mean you're unimportant. None of us are unimportant. Each one of us are part of the body. I pray that God will stir up this spirit within us. We are all called. We are all to carry the good news. We are all messengers. But you know, know what? Not every one of us is delivering the message. So I encourage you today, be an Andrew. I think the past two years have shown us that, you know, the way to win souls is not only from, you know, the public pulpit. We often think too little 
of ourselves. We think, you know, we can't achieve anything because I'm not a well-known evangelist. I think there may have been a season for that, but now we need to move outside the four walls. We need to go into the community and start reaching to the people out there. There is no shortage of people needing to hear the gospel. The harvest is plenty. People want, people want more personal contact now. They want authenticity. People need to see Jesus through us. You know, studies have revealed that 86% of the people that come to church, they came because of a friend or a relative invited them to come. And studies also reveal that over 80% of people that say they would likely to come to church if someone would just invite them to come. And that is something we can all do. We can invite them to come to church with us. You know, you don't have to memorize 100 verses. You don't have to know the Bible off by heart. All you have to do is invite them to come with you. Come and you will see. Keep pointing people to Jesus. Just as Jesus invited Andrew to come and see, Andrew became the one that said, come, let me show you Jesus. And now today is your turn. Be an Andrew to someone. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you. You know, through the life of Andrew, you have shown us what a passionate life for Jesus looks like. Father, I pray that, you know, never let our focus be off you. Never let us be man-centered or self-focused, but be kingdom-focused. Let us be faithful to the mission that you have called us to do. And Lord, we want to be the one to tell them, come and see what Jesus can do. Let them have an encounter with you. So Father, today, empower every one of us. Give us boldness. Give us courage. Give us the eyes to see, you know, even the insignificant things, small things. Father, because we know when we surrender these things to you, it can become of great value. And Lord, you can multiply you can magnify and your name will be glorified. So Father, we thank you, especially during this season. Father, let us be Andrews in the world today. We thank you, O oh God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my